Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you and uh, love to everybody out there. Um, my website is jasonbirdspreacher.com, you can also go to Royal Blood Ministries website, uh, you can get me on Facebook, you can get me on Twitter and it's good to be with you. Um, so we're looking at a sermon today and uh, So let's come before the Lord. Uh, this sermon was uh, preached at a church today uh, on the south side of Manchester. Uh, so I preached it to uh, a congregation and um, I thought you might like to have the benefit of the sermon, so I hope it's a blessing to you. So let's come before the Lord. Father, we come before you today, and we thank you for your goodness and love. And Father, I pray in your name, Lord, and for your glory, that people would be ministered to, to, to through the sermon, that Father, uh, you would be honoured and that you'd be glorified, that people would be fed your word today through this sermon, and that, Father, they would be blessed. And, Lord, I pray for the power of thy Holy Spirit. And I just pray that you would be glorified in this for your honour and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, we're looking at 2 Corinthians um, chapter 11 and 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. Uh, in the two, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we look into a, the first uh, 10 uh, or 12 verses. Um, and then the whole, we're looking at the whole of uh, chapter 11. So we're going to read the, the whole chapter. So get your Bibles out. We're, we're getting into the meat of the word today. And... Uh, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you as one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through this subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye received another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostle. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offence in abasing myself that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable uh, to no man for that which was lacking to me. The brethren which came from Macedonia supplied uh, all things and I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the region of Achaia. Wherein, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do, that will I will do, that I may cut off occasion, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that therein they glory they may be found even as we. For as such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed in an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if the ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not 
uh, or after the Lord, but all, as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh our glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. I speak concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews, so am I. Are they Israelites, so am I. Are they the seed of Abraham, so am I. Are they ministers of Christ, I speak as a fool, I am more. In labours more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death often. Of the Jews five times receive I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, and a night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst four brethren, in weakness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things are without that which cometh unto me daily the care of all the churches, who is weak, and am I not weak, who is offended, am I burned not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for ever, knoweth that I lie not. In Damascus the governor under Aratus, the king, kept the city of the Damascusines with a garrison desirous to apprehend me, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. If it is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord, I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago, where in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knowingly such as one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such as man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into the paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter, of such as one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For well, though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this Thing I besought the Lord thrice, and it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in the infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So the sermon is called in the heat of battle in the heat of battle in the heat of battle people can boast and like to boast you know imagine someone uh, buying a car they've got a fantastic car and they're flashing it off to you they're showing off or somebody buys a gold watch and they flash it off to you and they show it off as a christian we can be walking in the things of god and People are showing off, they're trying to be something in front of us and trying to intimidate us by saying, look at my position, look at my possessions, look at me. And in the time of the Apostle Paul, there were people in the time of Paul who were flashy people boasting in front of him, saying that they're super apostles, that they should be looked up to, that Paul wasn't a great speaker, that Paul was into grace, and they were into the real Judaism, into the law. And they were flashy and they were great and he, they were amazing and Paul was plain and simple and they kind of boasted about this to the people. They were false apostles. This boasting you can see shown in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 13. It says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles 
of Christ. So there were these false apostles deceiving people. And if you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 18, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also. So Paul is saying, look, they're glorying, they're flashy, our glory, but when he glories, he's not going to glory in a flashy way. He's going to show them the right way to, to defend yourself. But they were glorying fleshly, in a fleshly way. Uh, and maybe you are feeling intimidated by somebody. Maybe somebody's intimidating you. You feel intimidated by their gifting, by their possessions, by their position, whatever it is. You, you feel intimidated. Well, uh, turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 7. And try and get your Bible out. Try and follow me. Try and get into the Word of God. Let's do a Bible study with me and get into the Word of God. And get your Bible out and, and look at the verses with me. And then you'll get more benefit. So 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 7. 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 7. And thy anger of the Lord was kindled against your eye. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Was it 2 Samuel chapter 6 and 7? 2 Samuel, let's have a look. 2 Samuel 6 verse 7. Oh, verse 7. It must be 1 Samuel. Let's, have, let's go to 1 Samuel. Sorry about that, folks. No, it can't be one son. It's got to be. Uh, sorry about that. I read it today. But God, basically the passage that I was looking for, which if someone could find it for me. Uh, basically, um, it's the passage where it says that God looks on the heart. That God... Uh, I think I'll be... I will we'll continue. I've got my notes in my bag. But, but there's a passage where it talks about that God looks on the heart. He looked at David's heart. Uh, and God was interested in the sincerity of David's heart. And that's what God's mainly interested in your life. He's not interested in your position, in your possessions, in your power or whatever. He's more interested in your heart. And if your heart is sincere, then you, you, you made it with God. He loves a sincere heart. So if anyone comes to you and they're impressing you with their gifts or impressing with you with their posi position or possessions, then so long as you've got a sincere heart with God, you're on the right path. So... My first point, that's just an introduction. Uh, sorry I couldn't find that verse. Sometimes when I'm writing um, scripture out, I, you know, because there's so many scriptures I write out for a sermon, you just wrongly write it, so forgive me. But my first point is, the heart of the battle, in the heat of the battle, keep to the simplicity of the gospel. In the heat of the battle, keep to the simplicity of the gospel. If you've ever made a jelly, when the jelly is made and you pull it out of its uh, tin, the jelly will start to wobble. And in the time of Paul, there were some wobbly Christians. They were wobbling. They were, they were wobbling into error. They were wobbling over to things that were not right. So you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 and 4. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, uh, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I love that. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you received another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So there were these people that were coming in with with uh, extravagant kind of doctrines 
and they'd moved away from the simplicity of the gospel and people were following them. So if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So they, they thought these super apostles were, were, were brilliant. But Paul saying, look, even Satan comes as an angel of light. These are not good for you. And maybe somebody here who's listening to this sermon, maybe you've been wobbling as a Christian. Maybe the Mormons have knocked on your door and you thought, I, I, I'm really interested. I like the way they, they are. I don't get much love from the church. I'm, I'm tempted to go to the Mormon church. But if you go to the Mormon church, it sounds very much like what we believe. But when you scratch between the surface and you go behind what they believe, they believe that uh, Satan and uh, the Lord Jesus are brothers. It gets quite complex when you look into it. Uh, maybe you're tempted to go with Islam. Maybe you think, well, you know, there's more people there and they seem to uh, be more of them and they seem to be more zealous than Christians. I'll go to Islam. But if you go to Islam, it says that you should only have four wives and yet the, the prophet had more than four wives. So he couldn't even keep his own word. But inevitably, these her heresies and false teaching, they corrupt the simplicity of the gospel. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. A chaste virgin to Christ. In the time of Paul, a father really was given the responsibility in the family to make sure that the daughter kept the virginity. It was a big, big thing in society those days. And what Paul is saying is, look, I am a father to you. I, I want you to be pure. I want to protect you and to honour you and to cherish you and to nurture you in the things of, of sound doctrine and sound practice. But they didn't want to listen to Paul. They didn't want that love of a pastor, that simplicity of preaching. They wanted the flashiness. They wanted the new thing. In Acts chapter 17, the various Athenian philosophers were people who wanted to hear a new thing. And this idea of a new thing was all around the Greek world. Let's hear the new thing. And so, in the time of Paul, there were people who were saying, here's the new thing. We don't want the, the kind caring pastor with his simple gospel. We want the new thing, the new flashy uh, apostles. Uh, and are you tempted with that? Are you tempted? Uh, you, you're not stable, you're wobbling as a Christian because you want the new thing. Oh, that pastor's on TV and he's written a new book and he's had a mighty revelation. Oh, I want that. And, 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 you, and you want excitement and you want entertainment, but you don't want the simplicity of the gospel. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy, uh, let's go to some scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Two Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away from their ears from the truth and shall be turned uh, onto fables. In the last days, people will get more and more into heresy. If you turn to 1 John chapter 4, one John chapter 4, verse 1 to 3, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God, every spirit, that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is of God, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is, is not of God. And, sorry, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming to flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, wherein you have heard that it should come, even now ready is in the world. There will be people who will be teaching against the sound doctrine of who Christ is. If you turn to Galatians 
chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 9. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we laid therefore, uh, and we said before, so I say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. Are you wobbling as a Christian because... You've got to be aware that there are false teachers are about. There are lots of false teachers about. And, and if you're not following the simple gospel that Jesus died and rose again, that he's the son of God, if you're not following that simple gospel, you're just going to be wobbling all over the place. You know, it's like the Titanic. You know, the Titanic went down because the, the watchmen were not watching properly. They, they took the rise off the ball and, and they hit the iceberg. Uh, and, and, and you need to be watching for the heresy that's coming in. But you're not, and you're wobbly. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. The false Christ and false prophet shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. More heresies coming in in the last days. And we're in the last days. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. False teachers again coming in. Verse 30. And of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. There are false teachers. One of the great things that we need to do at the moment, we need to get back to sound doctrine. We need to be reading the Puritans. You need to be reading Thomas Watson, John Bunyan. Read some of those Puritans. Get some of those old Puritans, go on the Banner of Truth Trust and get some Puritan Banner of Truth, Puritan paperback books, £2, £3. Start reading the Puritans and get some iron in your soul. Get some biblical truth in you. That's what we need at this hour. We need to be in the Bible. But you're becoming a jelly Christian, wobbly, taken in by every false teaching you need to be strong you need to be solid in the word of God if you don't love the truth if you if you don't love the word of God if you don't love sound doctrine then you're going to go all over the place you're going to be all over the place It's not law. I know that some of you have been sat there going, oh, he doesn't understand we're free in Christ and oh, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And Oh, he doesn't understand it's all about grace. Of course it's about grace. It's about being saved in the Lord. But it's about sound doctrine, my friends. If you don't believe me, read Acts chapter 2. Near the end, it said they met for fellowship. For sound doctrine. If you read Titus, it talks about in chapter 1 that the elders are to hold to sound doctrine. Doctrine has become a dirty word. People don't like the word doctrine. Well, I'm going to say it. doctrine, doctrine and doctrine. Get it into your head. Doctrine is a good word. It's a beautiful word. Hey, it's a biblical word. And that's what you need. You need some sound teaching. Number two, in the heat of battle, 
you will be attacked. In the heat of battle, you will be attacked. Now, when you become a firefighter, like we saw the Inferno, that terrible thing that happened in London, the firefighters were there, they were walking up the stairs and they were battling the fire. If you're a Christian and you're serving the Lord, you're going to be in the heat of the battle, there's going to be fire coming at you. Paul had this in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 24, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 24. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Here's a, here's a logical statement. Sincerity does not mean an easy life. Sincerity does not mean an easy life. Paul was sincere, he was really sincere. But it wasn't easy for him. He, he got beaten up. He got beaten up for his faith. He was so sincere. He was pouring out his life to people, helping people, encouraging people, strengthening people, providing for people. He was so sincere for the work of God. Yet he had his heart broken. Time and time again, his heart was broken. Think about John MacArthur, the great preacher. Um, John MacArthur, he was... Uh, Pouring into this guy for a couple of years, this young man, and he was encouraging this young man and teaching this young man and giving him books and encouraging him and pouring his life into this young man. And some years later, John MacArthur's at a conference and this young man is giving out leaflets at the conference and he takes a leaflet off the young man and he looks at it and it said, John MacArthur, a heretic. Broke John MacArthur's heart. He had he, given to this young man, and this young man knifed him in the back. And, and if you're sincere, and you're serving the Lord in whatever capacity, whether as a husband or a wife or a father, or in Christian ministry, whether it be a Sunday school teacher, youth worker, pastor, whatever, missionary, and you serve the Lord, then you will be heartbroken. People will break your heart. Acts chapter 16. Let's look at a few verses. Acts chapter 16 verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Let's go to two, you can look at Acts chapter 22, verse 29, Acts chapter 23, 35. But let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. Paul really, really was up against it. Acts chapter 6, uh, two, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter, that was in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. But in all things have proven ourselves to be ministers of God in much patience of in affliction, in necessities, in distress, in stripes, in imprisonment, in, in tumults, in labours, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by loving unfeigned. And he, he, he suffered for the gospel. Maybe you feel like giving up, maybe you, you, you feel like throwing in the towel. You've been battered and you've been hurt and you've been broken and you don't seem to get a lot of affection. You don't seem to get a lot of love coming your way and you give and give and give and people take and take and take and it doesn't come back to you and you feel like, I've had enough, I can't cope with it. It's too much for me. But it gets worse. Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Psalm 55, 
verse 12 and 14. For it was not an enemy that reproached me that I could have borne it, neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, my equal, my guide, and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. That is one of the toughest things to experience. Not only are you sincere, and you give and give and give, and you help and help and help, but then, in the midst of your pain, someone you love who is close to you sticks the knife in and it's not there for you anymore. That is the hardest thing to experience. Have you experienced that? Are you experiencing that? My friend, if Paul could go through all those beatings, have you gone through all this? 2 Corinthians 11.26 In journeyings, often in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils of the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often in hunger and thirst, in fasting, often in cold and nakedness. Have you experienced all that? You can get up. He said, yeah, I can't get up anymore. I can't get up. I can't do it anymore. I just feel like I want to lie here and I'm tired and I'm discouraged and I'm burnt out and I'm unappreciated, I'm unloved and, I, and the person that I love the most has knifed me in the back and I just want to pack it in. I don't want to preach anymore. I don't want to serve anymore. I don't, I just don't, I don't want to do it anymore. I can't do it anymore. I haven't got the strength anymore. Did you go through what Paul went through? Have you been beaten so, so raw that your back is bleeding red raw with the beating and the whipping? Have you been stoned to death so much that you're lying on the floor, dragged out of a city and lying on the floor and you just can't get up because you're half dead? Have you gone through that that Paul has? Then get up. You've got to get up. Wipe away the tears and say, I'm not having it anymore, I'm getting up. Yes, I know it's been painful. I know it's been hard. I know it. But there is a work for you to do. There is a work for you to do. I want to get into the last part of the sermon. I want to do it now, but I'll leave it. There, I'll leave it for later. But there's a work for you to do. There are the kids that need you. The kids that are in your family, they need you. Uh, Alright, your husband may not love you the way you want him to love you, but he needs you. Your church might not appreciate you, but it, it needs you. But above all, Jesus, it's all for Jesus. He needs you. He wants you. Get up for him. Love him and say, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. I'm hurt. I'm in pain. But Lord, I love you and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to live for you and I'm going to bring glory to you. Oh Lord, I love you. Praise your name, Lord. I'm hurting. I'm in pain, but I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to bring glory to you. You don't let the enemy snap you. Don't let the enemy break you. Don't let the enemy pull you down. You've got to arise. And you might be like a, a little bird that, that, that has broken its wings and, and, and it just flapping and, and it can hardly breathe and it's just there, that little sparrow and it's just flopping its wings and it's, it's not any, had anything to eat and it's tired and it, it's just flopping and there are, there are foxes around just waiting to pounce on this poor little sparrow and you're, and you're just there and you, you, you just feel like I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it anymore. Uh, my wife left me or my husband left me or my, my ministry is not what it should be. I'm not appreciated. I'm not honoured. I'm, I, 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 
and and I, I, I just can't do it anymore. And I, I, or you, or you, or, 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 or I'm with my wife or husband, and they they they, they don't love me as as I love them. They don't talk to me. They don't appreciate me, and and I'm burdened. I've got to look after my kids, and they need me, and and it's so burdensome. I have to keep helping them, and I've got a wife or I've got a husband, and they need my needs, and and then people want me to do things for them, and people want me to do things at church, or or you're a pastor and you you you've been serving and serving, and and they and you have had your heart broken, you have had your heart ripped out. Get up, get up, get up. Even if you're staggering, get up. Get up. Get up. I can't. I can't. I've had it, Jay. I've had it. I can't. I've had it. I've had it. I'm hurt. I'm too hurt. I've worked for the church for 40 years and I've given and given and they just don't appreciate it. I can't do it anymore. Well, I, 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 was a, I was a big shot in a denomination. I was a, I was a big shot. I was a big time servant of the Lord and I've just fallen by the wayside. I can't do it anymore. But yeah, I've been battling with sin and I keep losing and I can't beat it anymore and I, I just can't do it. And you just feel like I can't do it anymore. And maybe some of you are lying in bed and for days you're just depressed. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. You've not been beaten and whipped to death like Paul. You weren't thrown into the fire like Latimer and Ridley. You weren't in prison for 12 years like John Bunyan. You weren't killed and strangled to death by William Tyndale. So come on. Let's fight. Come on. Let's fight for Jesus. Let's stand for the Lord. There's much battling to do. Shake the discouragement off. Shake it off. And let's fight. For the master. Number three. In the heart of the battle, cherish your revelations of God's love. In the heart of the battle, cherish your revelations of God's love. Me and a friend uh, called Mike, I don't say things like this, but me and Mike once, uh, we were preparing to do evangelism. And I, I, I'm not boasting because I believe that every child of God will know tokens of God's love in their life. And me and my brother, we were praying one morning uh, to go out to do evangelism and suddenly I, I, I felt like my body was transported. Uh, this is metaphorical, not, not literal, but I felt like my body was transported before the very throne of God and I, and I felt like I was right in the midst of the throne of God and I could sense that an awesome presence of God I turned around after the prayer and I looked in awe at Mike and Mike was looking at awe of me. I said, did you feel it? And he said, yeah. And he felt the same, that we were both brought before the very throne of God. And God gives us tokens of his love. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 to 5. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and to revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth such as one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. And that he was caught up into the paradise, and I heard unspeakable words which is not lawful of a man to utter. As such is one I will glory, yet not of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Paul had a revelations of, of, of heaven, the third heaven. And it is our privilege as Christians as we come to believe in Jesus 
the Holy Spirit is in our hearts and we've got a down payment of heaven right now and we can feel the glories of God. It's kind of like a woman who is blind and this is a true story, she was blind and she'd never seen the world and her parents would try to describe the world and one day uh, she went in for an operation and they were, they helped her to see and they pulled off the bandages and she looked and wow, the sky is so beautiful, the sun is so beautiful, you didn't tell me how beautiful this is, it's so beautiful. When you come to know the Lord, you, you get a sense of the glories of heaven uh, and it's beautiful. If you read Romans chapter 8, it talks about, um, if, we, if we go to Romans chapter 8, we'll, we'll just read a few verses. Romans 8. Romans 8. It says, verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. For, and, and it it talks about the Spirit of God in that middle of that chapter, bearing with our spirit that we are sons of God. And the Holy Spirit will give you uh, experiences of God's love. Experience. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 44, it talks about that we're given a new body one day. One day we're going to give a new, given a new body. So what, what I'm saying here is, Paul had this revelation of the third heaven and and in the midst of your pain, God will show you his revelation of heaven. You, the Holy Spirit will give you a sense that you're his son and daughter. And will show you the glories to come. And there are times where you, you to appreciate them and to, to just dwell on them and enjoy them. Uh, of his love for you. So in the heat of battle, God will give you these tokens of his love, revelations of the glories to come, as the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a son and daughter of God. If you want to listen to something there, go to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' Recording Trust, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' Recording Trust, and listen to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones preach on Romans 8. Romans 8, and, you, and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones and Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' Recording Trust Listen to his sermon series on Romans 8 and you'll enjoy a feast of the glories of heaven. Number four. In the heat of battle, see your struggles from a new perspective. In the heat of battle, see your struggles from a new perspective. <clears throat> Let's turn to 2 Corinthians Two Corinthians chapter twelve verse seven and ten. I have committed an offence. Sorry, sorry. Two Corinthians chapter twelve verse seven to ten. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given to me, a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, and it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He had a thorn in the flesh. The Greek there is the idea of a peg, and it would be about 18 inches so this 18 inch peg was like thrusting into Paul metaphorically. Something was crushing him. Maybe something in your life, some person, some circumstance is, has been crushing you. You've been saying, God, take it away from me. God, take it out of my life. But God doesn't seem to be. And it's crushing you. And you said, Lord, I can't take it anymore. Why is it that God allows that? Why is it that God doesn't allow you to be in the position that you want to be? You want to be in a certain position. And the position is a, pit, a place of ease. But God doesn't allow it. He allows difficulty in your life. 
And you'd say, God, take it away, but he doesn't take it away. Why is God doing that? God is teaching you to rely upon him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 and 11, it talks about God is a father who disciplines us. He disciplines us, keeps us humble. In uh, Job chapter 1, verse 6, 22, um, God allows Satan to buffet Job, and, and Satan is allowed to buffet Paul. But Satan is in control, uh, is controlled by God. Satan cannot harm you or do anything without the permission of God. And Satan was buffeting Paul with a thorn, with a temp peg of 18 inches. Something was crushing Paul. He cried out, get it away from me. And God would not let it go. He allowed it to stay and it crushed Paul's pride. Paul's pride was crushed. To the very core of his being, it crushed him. And this situation in your life, to the very core of your being, crushes you. And you wonder, does God love me? Does God care about me? Is God really here? Is God really in my life? Am I really knowing the love of God? Does God really, really love me? I am crushed to the very core of my being. This is humbling me and breaking me. And I don't like it. I don't want it. Please take it away from me. But God means it for good. In Genesis chapter 37, 28, Genesis 45, 4 and 8, Joseph is, has gone through difficulty and and he's like, he started with pride, look at my coat of many colours, and he goes through a very, very troublesome life. And it is God humbling himself. But in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, he says, let's look at it. Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis 50, verse 20. Genesis 50 verse 20 But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it, as it is this day, to save much people. God meant it for good. And it's a wonderful joy. Isn't that a relief? Do you know that the exact pain, that thing that crushes you to the core, is the thing that God has meant for good. It's the one thing that you don't want in your life, yet it's the one thing that is crushing your pride. It is the one thing that God is showing how much he loves you and he's working all things for good. If this thing in your life that is crushing you was not in your life, you'd be so proud. Look at me, I'm a brilliant minister. Look at me, I'm a brilliant husband. Look at me, I'm a brilliant wife. Look at me, I'm so wonderful. I'm so great. But no, God has allowed something in your life that crushes you. And you keep saying to God, take it away, take it away, take it away. You can't really love me if you don't take it away. And God is saying to you, my grace is sufficient for you. All things work together for good to them that love God. I am on your side, I love you, and I'm using this pain to bring glory to myself because this pain in your life is making you dependent on me. Not dependent in your qualifications, not dependent in your position, not dependent in your power, not dependent in you, not dependent in your surroundings. It's making you dependent upon my power. And I get the glory in your life. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And in Matthew 7, 9 and 11, it says, God is good and wants to give you good gifts. And he wants to give you good gifts. He loves you and he wants to give you good gifts. And this pain in your life that you try to say to God, please take it away, is a good gift because his love is in it because it's keeping you humble. And dependent on him. And that after all is really, really what you want, isn't it? When you think about it, when you come to the brass tacks, when you look back at your life over the years, really deep, deep down, the one thing that you've wanted, you've cried out and you've prayed to God, God, I want to really, really know you. 
I really want to be a woman of God. I really want to be a man of God. And you cried that prayer and you prayed that prayer. But over the years, God has allowed things in your life and it's been hard and it's been difficult and you've been saying to God, I don't think you really love me. Why do I have to go through this pain? This pain every day, this pain all the time. I can't cope with it. I don't like it. I don't want to. God says, you wanted to know me. You wanted to know me and to know me intimately. Well, this has to be, this has to be because this is making you depend upon me. You're relying upon me. You're learning about me. You're drawing your strength and your knowledge about me in this situation. When you see it in that light, glory to be, be to God, you begin to praise God. You begin to worship God. You begin to be a, a victorious Christian. You begin to be a person who can fight and fight and fight even though you're wounded, even though you're broken. You can now fight more than you've ever fought before in your life. Because you know how to move forward when you're broken. Because that pain that gnaws in you is using He's using. In the heat of battle, it's tough. But in the heat of battle, don't be a wobbly Christian. Some of you are wobbly. You're tempted to go with the Mormons, you're tempted to go with the Jehovah's Witness, you're tempted to go with atheism, you're tempted to go here, there and everywhere. What you don't want is the simplicity of the gospel. You don't want a pastor that loves you and preaches the word of God. Come on, that's what you need. You need a pastor that loves you. You need somebody who will preach to you the simplicity of the word. Not some flashy apostle who thinks of the bee's knees. You want a simple pastor who loves you, cares for you and preaches the word. Stop wobbling. You've been hurt. You've been hurt by a friend who loved you, cared for you, but they have turned on you. And on midst of, in the midst of that, you've been hurt by others. You've given and given and you've been sincere and you've given and given and yet you have been hurt. And you felt like giving up. You can't give up. You never have gone through all that Paul went through. He went through terrible suffering. William Tyndale went through terrible suffering. Uh, Latimer Ridley went through terrible suffering. You've not gone through terrible suffering like that. So you need to get up and you need to fight. But in the midst of your pain, God is good and he gives you tokens of his love and he will show you revelations of heaven and the glories to come because the Holy Spirit is in you and the Spirit cries, Abba, Father, where you say, where, where you see, sense the love of God. Enjoy those times and appreciate those times. They are tokens of heaven. We are going, excuse me, we are going to glory. This life is only the beginning. We have got a glorious heaven to go to. And fifthly, for a long time you have cried and cried yourself to sleep with tears, with your broken heart. Your heart has been broken. No one will ever know how much your heart has been broken. No one will ever know how much your heart has been broken. And you have cried to God to take it away, take it away, take it away. But it was an 18 inch nail that crushed you and broke you. But in that, God has humbled you. He humbled you. He humbled you. God, I can't cope with it anymore. God, I, please, I, I don't want it anymore. Please deliver me. Please, please, please. And it's a wound in your heart. A 16th nail peg broken inside you, crushing you. But behind it is a father's heart. Behind it is a God who loves you so much. 
a God who loves you so, so much that he's not going to pander to your every whim. A God who loves you so much that he knows how he's molding you, how he's growing you, how he's leading you. He knows what he's doing and he keeps it in there and it, and it keeps you humble. And he's molding you. He's molding you for better ministry. He's molding you for better relationships. He's molding you for heaven. He's molding you. It's a different perspective. It's a different perspective. And when you have that perspective, it brings light, it brings joy, it brings power, it brings, brings blessing. Johnny Erickson was a, a young woman, she was a great swimmer, and she jumped into the pool and she broke her neck and she became a quadriplegic. Plegic, and she uh, she couldn't walk anymore she couldn't use her hands anymore and she was just helpless sat in a wheelchair she couldn't do anything for herself for weeks she cried she couldn't undress herself she couldn't even scratch her nose and then when she got to later on in life, in her forties and fifties, she got breast cancer. I said, God, I can't cope with this. I, I, anything else with this? I, I'm, I'm a quadriplegic, but now I've got breast cancer. I can't cope with it. And she asked her friends to pray. But she got through it. She, God was keeping her humble, keeping her close to him. She displayed the glory of God. There's a guy, I don't know his name, but he was born with no arms and no legs. No arms and no legs. He's been all over the world preaching and he's been a blessing to millions of people. How humbling, no arms, no legs. It's kept him humble. And God has used him. His glory has shone through that man. And, and God loves you so much as his child. You trust him. And the pain and the hurt that you've been going through is terrible. But he loves you so much that even in this pain, God is working his purposes out in your life.